تل عالمین بارخ مار آوند و شمیه نز قداش ما اختیت ملکوثاخ نهو صویاناخ کند و شمیه اب ارام هولا لخم سنقان اليومان و شوقلا خوبین ای کنا داب خنان شواقا خیاوین ولا تعلى النسيون إلا فصا من بيشة مطو ذي لاخي ملكوتا وخيلا وتشبخت العالم علمين آمين فقدوا نتيم الموقف وال من دي قامة يرم شوخ طاوة هذا ترام لنا تي رابا ناشي من سبب أديو بين مشخ دنو خون بخيلت على أو خبلاطة باسيما عراق وكوريا إنا طاولة سو قبل هذا سوري ديزن أبينا هون زيل طامة قدم أودي سبورت وشجع إيقاع بني عمن إيراقايا رابع بغداد تنوي عموخن وداخل تصفاي خد شو بهم زمخ بلشان تإنجليز قم خد كم جوان قبل كنت أقول لخ خماته تي ما قبل لشان تإنجليز the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit one God Amen my beloved we're gonna talk tonight I'll try to be as brief as possible about something that we all go through, um, maybe on a separate intervals in our lifespan and our lifetime, and uh, and it can vary from one to another. Maybe some people go through this thing quite often in their life, and some maybe every now and then, and to some maybe it's a rare thing, and I hope it is a rare thing, and that is about fear. Fear, F-E-A-R, fear. I'm going to go to um, Zechariah first, um, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. Zechariah 2, 8. The Lord here, the Lord God is speaking. He's saying, anyone who strikes you strikes what is most precious to me. Anyone who strikes you um, strikes what is most precious to me. So the Lord Almighty sent me with the message for the nations that had plundered his people. The Lord himself will fight against you and you will be plundered by the people who were once your servants. When this happens, everyone will know that the Lord Almighty sent me. We're going to go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32, and we're going to read verses 8 to 10. Okay, Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 10. The Most High assigned nations their lands. He determined where peoples should live. He assigned to each nation a heavenly being. But Jacob's descendants he closed for himself. He found them wandering through the desert, a desolate um, wind-swept wilderness. He protected them and cared for them as he would protect himself. This translation is, is the Bible Society. I guess every translation is slightly different. Um, and here what it says that he found them wandering through the desert, a desolate windswept wilderness. He protected them and cared for them as he would protect himself. The proper translation, as he would protect the core of his eye, not himself. Anyone who strikes you, strikes the most precious things to me. That's the Lord God says. And the Lord God said, when he found his own people wandering in the desert, he went, he cared for them, he protected them as he would protect his own eyes. You know, the most vulnerable member in the entire human body is the eye. The most vulnerable and the weakest point or weakest member in the, in the human body is the eye. He says, I will care for you. If I see you wandering in the desert, if I see you being left alone, if I see you, be, you being kicked out and thrown away and nobody is to care for you, then I, the Almighty God, would, de would be your own carer and I will look after you like looking after my own eye. I look and protect my eye as 
I protect you. Fear, fear is something that I believe every human being um, has an issue with. And we all, um, you know, sometimes we struggle with it. Sometimes we struggle with it. And especially nowadays and, and in our time and age, the 21st century, um, especially the younger generation, maybe the younger generation, where they see a lot of things, hear a lot of things with the technologies and the media and the surroundings and what the society offers and, and does. And we see a lot of people around us, how they behave, how they react, how they talk, um, whether they be family members, um, immediate or, or distant relatives, or even the most powerful, I believe, after the parents is the friends what friends do and behave. We tend to fear a lot of things in our life. And um, one idea takes us to one side and the other one takes us to another. And then we get confused and lost between a lot of issues that are taking place. But I'm here to talk to you in very simple words. I'm not going to go into theology. I'm not going to go into difficult words where you do not understand. I want to talk to you in a very simplistic format where we can actually comprehend and relate to it. We fear a lot of things in life. And that fear makes us lose sense of direction. I'll tell you one fact. The human being, the way we are made and created by the Almighty God, he has put in us, we, He created us on the basis of love. And because we were made on the basis of love, then He put in us what we call freedom. Because there is no love that does not have freedom associated, associated with it. It doesn't work. Love is freedom, is not slavery. So whenever there is freedom, there is that will. That's why He put a will in us to choose to say yes in order to say no, to do this, and to reject something else. And since we have freedom, and since we have the capacity to a certain degree to decide to do or not to do, then whenever, listen to this carefully, whenever any one of us gets put in a situation where the outcome is obscure, meaning unknown. When I don't know what the outcome is, when I get put in that kind of situation where the future destiny is unknown or the result of my, um, or the result of what I am actually doing, I don't know what it's going to be, then I become anxious. Where does anxiety come from? You know, people struggle with anxiety, and they go to, to doctors, and they take medications, and they see psych psychologists, and sometimes psychiatrists, and I'm anxious, and I'm sort of in a chaotic lifestyle. What's happening? I don't know. I'm lost. And whenever we become anxious within ourselves, then fear starts to surface up, and I become very scared and vulnerable and very weak. What's going to happen to me? Who's going to look after me? What is the future holding for me? If I do this, who says, who can guarantee me that the outcome is going to be successful? And all these questions start to surface up, and then I become very anxious, and the level of anxiety goes high, and then all of a sudden, I'm a very fearful human being, scared to death. Don't know what to do. I'm scared. That's why the Lord Jesus made an emphasis on living by faith. Living by faith. Don't live using your head all the time. It's not healthy. You have to believe. Because I'm a free human being, I sit, I don't know what's happening uh, down the track, 
I start using my head, I start losing my head <laughs> because it gets me nowhere. But just like the Israelites nation, going in circle for 40 years in the wilderness, and at the end, they did not make it to the promised land because they used their head. They did not trust in the Lord. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you tonight, I said it's very going to be very simple. I'm going to share with you three true stories that happened to someone in, in very recent history. And how the almighty Jesus of Nazareth dealt with each one in his own ways that is fitting for that particular person. We learn a lesson from it. Before I do that, St. Augustine, um, St. Augustine was a saint in the 4th century. In the 4th century, he writes the following, or he says the following. He says, God, you embrace my existence with your care, as if you have forgotten the entire creation. God, you embrace my existence with care, with divine care, as if you have forgotten the entire creation. What is he saying? What is St. Augustine simply saying? He's saying the way you treat me, the way you spoil me, as if I'm the only one and there is no one else. God is the creator of the universe, the visible and the invisible things. God is the creator of human, the human race, and he is the creator of every other living creature on this planet and all the galaxies in the outer space. But when he comes to deal with one of us, he deals in a way as if I'm the only one that exists and nothing else. This is how much he loves me. This is how much he loves each single one of us. But because we are too busy, we are too busy with issues that are happening around us and in our lives, whether directly or indirectly affecting us, we use our energy and time and mind to try and come out with a solution for it. But all we are doing really is running after a mirage. You know what a mirage is? Like when you're in the desert on a hot day, when you look in a distance, you think there is water. And you're thirsty, obviously, you're in the wilderness and you're, you've, you've lost your, your, your direction. So you, you see it as if like it's a, it's a beautiful ocean in front of you. And you keep on running after it. And the further you go, the further it gets away from you. Because really it's void. So St. Augustine says, if we really focus, we will see that God cares so much about each one of us, but we lose track because we are busy with our own heads. Here we go. Ask yourself this question. Why are you scared? Why do you have fear in you? Did you know that fear, God never put a spirit of fear in no one? And if you read in the Bible, it says, <clears throat> I think it's John the Beloved says, uh, he, gives, he gives a list of people who will not make it to God's kingdom. Well, he lists, you know, the adulterers, the murderers, and whatever, whatever, whatever. But he puts on the number one, the number one that surpasses all other, the murderers and the whatever, whatever he puts, the fearful people will not make it to God's kingdom. You know why? Um, I'm not talking here about a fear when, when you walk at night time and you hear, you hear a whisper, you say, oh, 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 I'm scared. No, no, I'm not talking about that kind of fear. Sometimes it's good to have fear. It's healthy. I'm talking here about a different kind of fear, which is our topic tonight. A fear of what's going to happen to me. Am I going to be delivered? Am I going to be in good hands? Is my future guaranteed? Where am I going to end up when I die? I'm talking about this kind of fear, not um, someone it was chasing me in a, in a dark alley. And my question, why, what were you doing in that dark alley? Don't be there. <laughs> 
You know why the, the fearful people will, or the, the scared people will not enter God's kingdom? He's saying because they are the people that do not trust that God can save them and deliver them. These kind of people will not enter. It is not that God is, does not want them to enter, but they are closing the door in their own faces because they are saying, I have doubts that Jesus will come to my rescue. I'm scared. I think Jesus has left me. Jesus has forgotten me. Jesus has walked away from me because I'm a sinner, because I'm this, because I'm that. You know what? I'm praying, but things are not improving. It's getting worse. So it looks like Jesus has walked away and left me behind. I don't have hope in salvation. He's saying these kind of scared people cannot enter God's kingdom because they are shutting the door in their face. I'll tell you this true story. The first one um, took place in 1967 where there was a war. It's a true story. There was a war uh, you know, between Egypt and Israel, or Israelite people. In 1967, there was a war between these two nations, and other, other countries got involved in it as well. But anyway, uh, it was a very brief war, and um, the, the Jewish people really destroyed uh, Egypt in a very big time. Well, here's the story. Listen to this. There was this soldier um, and this big group of soldiers. Um, the, the air force of the Egyptian nation was totally destroyed uh, by the Israelite people, by the Jewish people, was totally destroyed. And there was a lot of chaos between the Egyptian army. And everybody started running and keep and leaving their posts behind and, and, and running away you know, trying to save their lives. And there was this group of soldiers who were running. They've, they've deserted their posts out of fear. They were running away to save their lives. And one of the soldiers was overweight, with all due respect to overweight people. He was slightly overweight, so of course, uh, someone who is lighter than that soldier would run faster. So what happened to this soldier? Out of the entire platoon or that group, he was running behind everyone because he was heavy duty. He could barely run. This enemy plane fighter comes, maneuvers overhead, and sees the group of soldiers all, go all together. He comes back to them and he throws a bomb in the middle of everyone and every, every soldier there got killed, except the fat one. <laughs> it's a true story. You know, probably this soldier was wondering, God, why am I fat? You know, I should have been much more healthier and slimmer. I could have run with, with my friends. And, and look at me now, I'm going to be left behind and the enemy is going to come and catch me because I can't run, I'm bre I can't breathe anymore. I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm overweight and I'm going to have a heart attack very, short, very soon. Uh, there's no water, there's nothing. You know what? I'm left behind. Why are you leaving me behind, God? You know, when we go through a difficult time in our life, the very first person we blame is God. <laughs> you know why? It's human nature. Human nature, it, it, maybe we don't, un, we don't realize why we blame God. You know why? Because a human nature or a human instinct, if you get into trouble, you will blame the most powerful person in your life. Why? Because the most powerful person is supposed to protect me, to look after me, to deliver me and save me from whatever difficult situations I go through. So is your most powerful person your mom? Then you'll blame your mom. Is your more, most powerful person your friend? Then you, you, bl you blame your friend. If, if to you, you're, the most powerful person is Jesus, then you will blame him. Where were you, Jesus? Why didn't you do something about it when I needed your help? But God operates totally different to our way of thinking. The Bible says, just like the sky is higher than the earth, so as God's intellect is higher than yours. Just like the East is so distant from the West, so is God's ways are so distant and different to your own ways. Don't take things into your own perspectives and intellectual understanding. Leave it to the 
supreme almighty God. So this soldier would have complained and whinged and blamed God left, right and center. And he's running behind everyone. He's saying, I'm dead. But guess what? Hey, there was a reason for you to be fat. So because that fat saved your life. Everybody else died. And you who were thinking you got left behind, you got saved. Anyway, this guy, he, he was an actually a Christian guy. And uh, when he saw all the soldiers got killed and he was left behind, he's still in the desert. So now he says, well, who's going to come to my rescue now? I'm left alone and there's no one. He, he ran out of water. Uh, he can't see as far as the eye can see. There was no rescue to come to him. He said, before I, do, I die a very slow, agonizing death, I'm going to kill myself and get it over and done with. Then he came to kill himself. He heard a voice inside of him. He said, you graduated from, um, from, an, uh, from a Christian school and you studied Christianity and you learned about Jesus Christ. How can you kill yourself? Jesus says, do not kill. It's a sin. So he, he came back to his senses. He said, no, 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 no. My Lord is Jesus. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm going to wait. So he started dragging himself along very, very slowly, you know, until he got to uh, one of these Arab tribes. They were, they had a, they, you know, they got a, one of those tents somewhere in the desert. He got to this Arab guy and this, this Arab guy looked after him until he recovered his energy and his breath and his life again. And this guy said, I don't have a son. Would you be my son, adopted son? He said, no, I got to go and give myself back to the army. I made an oath that whatever happens, I will go back and report to my superiors. So he said, I have to leave you and I got to go and report to my superiors. Anyway, he went back and reported to his superiors. And you know what happened after a little while? He became a priest in the church of Christ. He serves the Lord. So even when things go wrong in our life, it's good. Who says that only good things are good? Even the bad ones are good. Who says that success is good? Always. No, failures are absolutely as healthy as success. When you fail your exam, why are you, why are you scared? Why are you angry? Why are you upset? Why are you mad? Why, why, why? Failures are good. They're healthy too. It's not always good to see the light. Sometimes you should, you should see the darkness in order to appreciate the light more. Another story? It's going to get better. There was this young man. You know, as young people, they, you know, they, they like to go and, and search for a better future for themselves and make something out of themselves good. So anyway, he left his, his mom and dad, his home, and he went searching for a better job in another city. These are all true stories. And he went and he found a place to rent. And he rented this place and he was living this singlehood life alone in this home. He was going to work, coming back home. And after a little while, uh, some people met him and they started becoming friends with him. Uh, Hi, how are you? What's happening? What are you doing? Who are you? Where are you from? And all this. And then after a little while, they became good friends. And before he knew it, they started coming and visiting him at home. Obviously, he's living by himself. There is no one else to uh, look after him or supervise him or give him advices on how to live life. So these friends started coming to his house, and he's living alone. And then uh, day in, day out, they started asking him, you know what, we're sitting here at home with you. It's kind of boring. This guy was a very good Christian, by the way, a very good Christian guy, very good Christian. So he used to go to work, to church, come back home. And anyway, these friends started talking to him. He said, this, this kind of life is kind of boring, don't you? He said, what do you mean it's boring? He said, no, well, we need to have some fun, you know? Have some fun in life. There's nothing wrong with that. He said, what do you mean by having some fun in life? He said, you know, we come in here, you give us water, you give us this. How about you give us a beer for a change? Let's flex the old elbow, as they say. Yeah? <laughs> He said, but I don't drink beer. He said, okay, you don't drink beer, but is it a sin? It's not a sin. Who says it's a sin? Come on, man. Relax. Don't be an oversaved Christian. Relax. Have fun, brother. Get down. Go to downtown club band. <laughs> so anyway, they started convincing him. The issue with this young boy 
You see, every one of us has a weak point in our life. Every one of us has a weak point. The weakness of this young boy, anyone can persuade him, influence him, and make him change his mind. Anyone. It was just an open book. Whoever wants to write whatever, he would allow them. So they said, have a drink. They convinced him. That was his weakness. He would listen to anyone. That was his problem. So he started drinking. And then, before he realized this young boy, the house where he was living turned into a very filthy house. All kind of people started coming there, if you know what I mean. This guy is a Christian. You see, what's been planted in us as Christian principles and values, no matter where we go, and no matter how much time we spend searching the world and the pleasures and the treasures of the world, but what's been rooted in us will eventually surface us up. So what happened to this young boy? After a little while, he saw himself in the deep, doing all the wrong things in life. Now listen to this true story. Wow. One day, he started coming back and praying to the Lord. Lord, get me out of this mess. I hate myself. I hate my life. I hate everything because everything is wrong. And what I'm doing, I'm ashamed of myself. And it is really choking me, suffocating me. It's killing me. I am dying a very slow, agonizing death. Please, Lord, you are the Savior. You said I am the Savior of the world. Come and save me because I can't do it anymore. And if you don't come, only you know what's going to happen to me or what I'm going to do to myself. One day this priest, now listen to this. One day this priest was going to visit someone at home, at their home. And this, this area, the names of the streets looks like they were very very sort of similar to each other, the names of the streets in this particular area. It's a true story. So anyway, he goes, and the priest thought that he entered the right street. It was house number, uh, it was, uh, uh, the complex was 12, unit 6. So he entered the street, and he looked at the complex 12, unit 6. So he said, yes, I'm here. He went and knocked at the door. And to the priest's surprise, this young man opens the door, and when he opens the door, he sees a priest in front of him. That young man goes wild. Oh my God, priest, oh no. He started screaming, jumping, falling on the ground, getting up. He started acting like a maniac, lunatic. The priest is shocked. The priest realized he was at the wrong address. But then he came closer and looked inside the house to see if it was a Christian house or not. He looked and there was pictures of saints on the wall. He said, thank God it's a Christian house at least. And then anyway, he said, my son, can I come in? <laughs> he said, yeah, 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 please, Father, do, do, come. Anyway, after a little while, you know, this young boy comes to, uh, back to his senses and he sits down. He said, my son, can you tell me what is this foolish act that you just showed in front of me? Is this a circus or something? He said, no, Father, I'll tell you. He said, I knelt a few minutes ago. I knelt on my knees and I begged Jesus. I said, Jesus, do you love me? If you still love me, if I'm still worthy of your love, if there is still at a slightest chance of me still being with you, if you really love me and still love me, I want a sign and a proof from you right now. If you don't show me a sign, if you don't give me a proof that you still love me, you know what? I'm going to be gone forever. He said, if you still love me, Jesus, I want you to send one of your priests to my house. 
And just as this young man, man finishes his prayer, a knock at the door. He opens, he goes wild, a priest standing at his front door. He said, that's why, Father, I went berserker, because from happiness that Jesus still loves me, he heard my prayer. I asked for a sign, he gave it. I just finished prayer, and I said, send me one of your priests. And you knocked at the door. He said, my son, I wasn't coming to your house. I usually don't make mistakes with, with people's addresses, but Jesus made me make a mistake this time. It wasn't a mistake, it was deliberate because he wanted to tell you that he loves you. Why are you scared? Jesus is here. Don't fear. Why are you so worried? Now here is something much more powerful. <laughs> It's a true story. In 1958, in London, in a small town, village, whatever you want to call it, on the outskirts of London. So, in 1958, in this little small village or town on the outskirts of London, there was a beautiful small church there and a priest and a nice, beautiful, faithful Christians living there. In 1958, Life got very, a little bit tough in, in Great Britain, and um, the young people of that town, they were forced to go and look for jobs elsewhere because there was no jobs in that town that they used live, to, uh, to live in. So they left. All the young people left that town searching for jobs elsewhere. Who stayed there or who remained in that town? The elderly. So what happened? The church got closed and left behind because no people started going to church. You know why? Because when things go tough, when things go rough, <laughs> we have no, we don't feel like going to church. You know what? I've got too many problems on the plate. There is too many things going wrong in my life. Literally saw that. Yes. Church, church, no more church. I went to church, and I prayed, and I did this, and I did that, and it got worse. You know what? Forget about church. Marmari is out of the church. We don't want to go anymore. It's, a, it's, a, it's all, I don't feel like it. There's too many problems. I gotta work, I gotta pay the bills. My wife is nagging me. My son is doing this, my husband is that. My, I have people in Iraq I have to send money to. I have people in Syria. I've got all these problems, and now they come and talk, talk to me about issues in the church. Get out of my sight. I don't feel like praying anymore. So what happened to these older people? It's a, it's a rough life. So they gave up on God. Well, the only time you should never give up on God, the most important time is when you are in a lot of issues. <laughs> because the only one who's going to solve them for you is God, not you. So anyway, the church got closed, and the elderly people <laughs> gave up, and the priest gave up. Time went by, and one day it was Christmas approaching. These elderly people went to the priest. Father, we want to reopen the church and celebrate Christmas. He looked at them. They're falling apart, you know. He said... But the church has been deserted for so long, it is now not fit for us to do a service in it. It needs a lot of renovation, a lot of cleaning up. They said, we'll do it. I said, what? Are you serious? <laughs> you can't even carry yourself. How are you going to do it? No, Father, trust us. We'll do it. True story. The priest goes and opens the church. These elderly people in their 80s, 90s, they started cleaning, sweeping, getting the, uh, the, all the webs out of, the, out of the walls and the ceilings, and they made it immaculate. And before Christmas came, a big cyclone came, a wind blowing up so badly damaged the church. And one part of the wall from inside fell off. You know, the coloring and the, and the whatever it was there inside of the wall fell off. And it got all messed up again. 
And the priest said, it looks like you're not going to celebrate Christmas. But look at these elderly people, huh? They said, no, we will clean it again. Go, Centerlink. <laughs> we will clean it again. So they went and they cleaned the church again. Now, in the meanwhile, this priest, he went to this auction. Now, listen. He went to this auction, and as he was, you know, looking around for things, he found this white piece of beautiful cloth. And to his thinking, he said, you know what? This white piece of cloth is going to be perfect to cover that damaged wall from inside. So he entered the auction and he bought that white cloth. On that white cloth, he noticed on one of the top corner, there was two initials woven into, into that corner. Two initials. He didn't know what it was. Anyway, he bought it. So he's going back to his town. He got into this bus and he sat and there was an old woman sitting next to him in the bus. And she started weeping, that woman. And then he, he looked to her, that priest, he, he said, uh, Mama, why are you crying? What's wrong? She said, I'm a lonely, elderly woman. I live by myself. I don't have anyone here. And every time Christmas comes, I always pray and I say, Lord, who am I going to spend Christmas with this year? It's lonely. It's depressing. I get so hurt. No one to celebrate Christmas with. He said, Mama, don't worry. Hey, guess what? You're lucky this time. We're gonna, we have some other elderlies like you, and we're going to celebrate Christmas together. You come with me. You come with me. We go to the church, and we celebrate together. He said, really? He said, yeah, of course. So she looked at the cloth, and she said, by the way, Father, where did you get this cloth from? He said, I bought it from an auction. Why? She said, this cloth belongs to me. He said, belongs to you. What is that? True story, huh? 1958. Belongs to you? What do you mean belongs to you? How did it get here? She said, yes, Father, I recognize the cloth from the two initials on it. I made them myself. She said, I am originally from Austria, and a war erupted in Austria, and then the news came to me that I was married, and we didn't have any kids. With the man I married, we never had any kids. And then the news came that your husband is being killed in the war. So I left Austria and I, my, I came to, to England, to London. Um, you know, I don't want to remember anything to do with Austria. So she said, I made this and these initials, one is mine and one is my husband's. But he died in the war. He said, anyway, my, da my, my daughter, come with me. They went in there and they celebrated the Christmas Mass together. Everybody was happy. This, wa this lady was happy. And everybody walked away. But prior to that, the priest asked her, he said, where do you live? She said, I live at a place where I am a maiden. I serve in that house. I live with some people. I clean their house and they give me some food and, you know, some shelter. You know, I live behind the house. So she gave the priest that address. And anyway, everybody left and went um, their ways. This old man came. He was still in the church. This old man comes and, you know, trying to say goodbye to the priest. And he said, Father, I noticed that cloth that you are hanging on the wall. Where did you get that from? And the priest said, what is this? Everybody's asking about the cloth. Come on, get a life. He said, yeah, no, no, please, Father, tell me, where did you get that cloth from? He said, okay, my son, I'll tell you. But someone else asked me. I got it from an auction. He said, Father, this cloth belongs to me. He said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, the two initials. One is mine and one is my wife's. He said, what? Yes. He said, but your wife, he said, I came back. I didn't see my wife. He said, but your wife, I just met her in the bus. She was here in the mess. And she told me that, you, that the news came, you, you were killed in the war. He said, no, I was not. Thirty years had passed. Thirty years had passed. 
He was in the church, but he did not recognize his wife. She changed. He said, whoa, stop. The priest ran. Anyway, he went to her, he went to her house because he gave, he gave the, she gave the priest the address. He went to that house. He said, you have this lady living here. They said she used to, but she left the house. He said, oh my goodness, what's going on? And he had the man with him. And as they were walking out, they said, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I think she left the new address with us. So they gave the new address to the priest, and that old man is with him. So they go to that new address, they knock at the door, and he said to the woman, I found your husband through that cloth which I bought from auction. You say, I don't have anyone, God has left me and gone. No one, worry, no one cares about me. I'm alone. 30 years, God was looking after this woman and this man. And he said, I will bring you together through a miracle cloth through auction. He reunited the husband and wife together again. We fear because we think it's the end. There is no hope. There is no point. There is no chance. It's all ruined. It's all destroyed. And the moment you say it's all over, that's when God is going to say it is not over. As long as I'm around, nothing is over. That's what you think, my child. That's what your intellect, your head tells you. But hello, my intellect is infinite. I am the Almighty. I can do anything and everything. To me, nothing is gone in vain. To me, nothing is too late. Who says it's too late for you? It's not for me. Was it too late for Lazarus? 100%. Lazarus rotted in the grave four days. Jesus deliberately waited. Jesus is God. He knew Lazarus was going to die. He could have gone and healed him while he was sick. But Jesus deliberately waited. He, they said to him, your friend whom you like is sick. He said, ah, oh, it's all right, leave him. He's asleep. Ah, oh, it's all right, he's leaving. And he stayed, he left him in the grave. One, two, three. After three days, my beloved, the entire body starts decaying. After three days, termites start to eat. So Lazarus had no veins. Lazarus had no skin. And most of his organs were gone, were decaying, were gone. With one word, Jesus made everything whole in him. That's God. It can't be any too late then, Lazarus, <laughs> because he was dead. As long as I'm alive, it's, and I say it's too late, then, you know, that's not good. Because as, if I'm alive, I can still manage to do, you know, things. But what would a dead person do? It's too late for him, 100%. But for Jesus, even the dead, it's not too late. But that's why, why do you fear the unknown, the future? Why? I'll give you 15 kind of fear people are fearful of. <laughs> 15. One, people get, they, they fear, they have fear of people. People have fear of people. I am afraid and scared of the people who surround me. They are nasty to me. I have fear of people. What they say about me, what they do to me, and what their plans for me. I have fear of people. I have fear of leaders. The pottery egg just kicked me out. I'm scared. And, and the manager just... He gave me a warning, and if I don't improve, he's going to sack me. And the Prime Minister of Australia is going to do this. Fear of leaders. I'll tell you this time as a biblical story. Augustus Caesar was the most powerful man on earth, ruling two-thirds of the world. Well, you can say the whole world. Augustus Caesar was the most powerful man on earth. He could do anything according to his intellect. He could do whatever he wants. He can bring anyone, kill anyone. No one can touch him. No one can say nothing to him. No one. And no one could. Very true. He was very powerful. One day he got up. He woke up. And he said, he had an idea in his head. He said, what if one of my workers here in the castle comes and asks me, I, Augustus Caesar, the ruler of the, the whole world. 
If he's going to ask me, how many people live under your authority? What am I going to say? I don't know. That's an embarrassment for me. What do you mean I don't know? He's talking to himself. Caesar, get your act together. He calls one of his servants. Come here. It's an order by the most powerful man on earth that a census go forth in my entire empire. Everybody is to go to their own hometown, to their own city, and write their name in this, in this census. I want to know today how many people live under my ruling. According to him, he can do whatever he wants. So the order goes forth. And the word gets to Israel, and it goes, sneaks all the way to Galilee, and then from Galilee go to little Nazareth. And who is in Nazareth? Our father Joseph the just, and our holy, most precious virgin of all virgins, Mother Mary. And she was already pregnant. And then they hear that Augustus Caesar has given a decree that everybody is to write their names in these senses, and they have to go back to their own hometown. Well, Mother Mary and our, our Holy Mother and our Father Joseph were from the lineage of King David. David's house or city is Bethlehem. So what they got to do? They got to go back to Bethlehem. That's where they belong. That's where they come from. Their roots are from there. Well, there is a prophecy in the Old Testament that when the Messiah comes, he will be born in what? Bethlehem. Jesus cannot break any of the prophecies. He cannot break them. Now, if they had stayed in Nazareth, he would have been born in Nazareth, and the prophetic word of God would have been broken. Jesus couldn't have saved me and you. So who put that thought in Augustus Caesar's head? God, the Almighty. It wasn't Augustus after all. But Augustus thought, Hey, I can do whatever I want. No, it wasn't you, Habibi. It was God who put it in your head. He is the supreme rule. He rules over everyone. So he put it in your head to give a degree so that Mother Mary and Father Joseph pick themselves up and go to Bethlehem. And when they got to Bethlehem, the time was to give birth. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem. <laughs> so who's ruling? Why are you afraid of leaders? Don't be afraid of leaders. God is in charge. Number three. We are afraid of the cross. We have fear of the cross. I don't want to carry the cross. There's too much tribulations, too much obstacles. It's, it's not easy carrying the cross. They keep on saying, carry the cross, carry the cross. Jesus says, if you love me, carry the cross. Oh, I'm sick and tired of carrying the cross. I've got nothing but problems. Everything going wrong. Everybody hates me. Everybody's thinking I'm stupid. Well, keep on carrying the cross. Don't fear. There was a, there's a true story about the cross, but I don't have the time to tell you. Um, and we have fear of service and the, the pain that it, in, it entails. I don't want to serve anymore. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. As a wife at home, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm sick and tired of it. As a husband, as, a, as someone working somewhere, uh, as a priest, as a, as, a, as a leader in the church, as a patriarch, as a pope, I'm sick and tired. You know, things are going wrong. I don't want to serve. There's too much pain in serving. I want to give up. I want people to serve me. I don't want to serve anymore. Don't fear. Serve. Serve people as much as the Lord gives you. People have fear of Mother Nature. Earthquakes, cyclones, floodings. They have fear of Mother Nature. People have fear of the future. People have fear of the past. The past keeps on coming back and daunting me, reminding me of all the bad things that I've done in the past. I hate myself. People have fear of justice. People, ha people have fear of the unknown. People have fear of the devil and the foul spirits and what they do. People have fear of exams. Oh, my heart is pumping 200 Ks an hour and the exam is coming and I'm, I'm sweating, I'm sweating and I'm so scared. I'm scared to the roots of my being. But you can't graduate without going through an exam. You can't enjoy the, um, the feeling of success without going through exams. You can't enjoy it. And when you, when you put on that, you know, that garment of that graduation day, you got that beautiful like me, you know, dressed up like that with a big hat on your head, 
and take a photo with the principal. Take a photo with this. Come, mom. Come, dad. Yoo-hoo! I was crying the other day, but today I'm laughing. I'm on top of the world. Exams are good. Why fear them? People are, they fear sickness, death. I don't want to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. What are you going to do? Huh? Stop being scared. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I'm going to go to Jenny Craig. I'm going to do dieting and all this. I'm going to eat all the beautiful, healthy food. Shut up. You're going to die. You're going to age. You got an eye on your face and, and stretch all the wrinkles. They're going to get back and wrinkle again and wrinkle again until you go down there, pit baby. So you do ironing. You do steaming. No good. It's part of life. One day I was born, now I'm a grown-up, tomorrow I'm going to age. Hey, this is life, enjoy it, stop wasting time on silly things that you have no control over. We worry about things that we have no control over. The Lord says, He said, the things that you see, you don't have control over. Why you worry about the things you don't see? He said, can you change the color of your hair from black to white and white to black? Yeah, you go and dye it, you make it like zebra, huh? But no matter how many times you dye it, if it's black, it's going to come back to the original color. That's the color God gave you. And if it's white, you dye it as many as you want. You go to all these hair salons and all these chemicals into your head, pumping, pumping. But the white color is going to come back, is going to come back and haunt you. (laughs) Oh, I'm old. So, I'm old. Look at this. It's white. I'm not going to go and dye it black just to look young. If it's young in the heart, be not in this. <laughs> People fear sickness and death and I don't know what. People fear envy. Hasid. Envy. I envy you. Talking about this, now listen carefully. Um, some people go and buy these chains or necklaces, whatever, and there's an eye in it. And they hang a big eye on the wall in the home. He said, why? Because when people come, we, they, we don't want them to hit us with their eye. <laughs> so they put an eye to break the eye. This is not Christianity, my beloved. If you've got such a thing at home, throw it in the rubbish. There is no such thing as I. He looked at me, I got crippled. She looked at me, I lost my job. Oh, okay. You know, if it was like that, (laughs) I don't think we would have been sitting here. (laughs) People fear black magic. You know what? Someone must have done something to me. They have closed every door in my face. They went to this guy or to this woman, and she did, and they did, and they must have written my name somewhere and wrapped it up and thrown it in the deep so no one can get it. Now I am dead for good. Whatever I do, I want to get married, the door gets shut. It gets to the last minute, ah, to put the ring, he changes his mind. I want to get a job? No. Centerlink is my friend. I can't get rid of Centerlink. Every time I apply, my friends get the job, I don't get the job. I don't have any luck. Someone has done black magic on me. I say to you, get a life. If you are a child of Jesus Christ and you trust in the Lord, and you have received his name, his baptism, his body and blood, and you believe in him, and you are holding on to his garment, there is no power in the entire universe that can take you away from him. Nothing. I will step on every black magic in the name of Jesus Christ. And every black magic. The moment you invoke the name of Jesus, the devil is like a little mouse. He will run away from you in absolute fear. But if you have that trust and that faith in Jesus. Some people are afraid of the truth. The truth hurts. The truth hurts. And they get so scared. I want to avoid that. And the truth does hurt. Doesn't it? You know, for Jesus to stand in front of the Pharisees and the priests and the high priest. Oh, Caiaphas and the rest of them. And he says, you are... The brood of vipers, the sons of the snakes. Now that is, that is a very powerful statement for, for, a, for someone. Uh, Jesus, for, for people, is just a normal, ordinary layman. He's not a priest, he's nothing. He's just a son of a carpenter, son of Mary. He's got no one. 
So for him to stand in front of the priest and the high priest and he says, you are the sons of the snake. Your father is Satan. Whoa, ho, ho, ho. That was the truth. The truth hurts, but you know what it does? Jesus also asked for trouble. <laughs> truth is like, is, is a revolution. You know, you want to change something? You want to change something, you speak the truth. You will hit them right on the sensitive nerve, but it's going to backfire on you. But hey, everybody comes with a price. Everything comes with a price. Jesus knew what the price was going to be by talking like that. But he said, unless I speak, no one is going to make a difference. No one is going to make a difference. Now, to end up on a much more positive um, thing, I'm going to give you some biblical verses to help you deal with fear. And please, please, uh, write them down and memorize them. Memorize a couple. Do you know how Jesus overcame Satan's uh, you know, temptation or trial? Biblically. Satan says it is written this. Jesus said it is also written. Biblically, when you memorize biblical verses, you can overcome Satan with his spiritual warfare. Number one, I'll give you the verses and then you read them and memorize. Memorize a few. If you can, all of them, that's wonderful. Psalm 23, 4. Psalm 23, 4 gives you strength against evil. Psalm 27, 1. Strength against evil. All, evil, mankind, human, race, everything. Psalm 27, 1. Psalm 23, 4. Psalm 27, 1. Psalm 118, verse 6. Psalm 118, verse 6 gives you the strength against people. 118, 6. 2 Timothy. This is the New Testament now. 2 Timothy 1, 7. 2 Timothy 1.7 gives you the, the spirit of power and love. 2 Timothy 1.7. Deuteronomy, the Old Testament, the fifth book in the Torah. Deuteronomy 31.6, God's assurance to you. Deuteronomy 31.6. Isaiah 41.10, again, God's assurance to you. 41.10. Again, Isaiah 41, 13, another verse, God's assurance to you. If I'm, more, if I'm going too fast, stop me. Romans 8, 15. Romans 8, 15, spirit of sonship. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Firm, being firm in faith. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. 1 Peter 3, 13 to 14. Strength, gives you strength. 1 Peter 3, 13 to 14. And then 1 John, this is the epistles of St. John. The first one, 1 John 4, 18. 4, 18, perfect love. Perfect love makes fear disappear. When there is love, there is no fee. When there is love, you cannot be scared anymore. Love makes fear disappear. Search for love, you'll get rid of your fear. I'm not talking about the love out there in the street. I'm talking about true love. Genuine love, sincere love. And that comes only from God, and God gives it to people on earth. You want to get to God, find the people that love Him. When you, when you associate yourself with people who are God-fearing, then you will have no more fear. God bless you. Thank you so much. Uh, the references, they want them in Arabic. Yes, of course. Mazmur 23, 4. Mazmur 23, 4. Mazmur 27, 1. Mazmur 27, 1. Mazmur 118.6 Mazmur 118.6 Timotheus الثاني Timotheus الثاني صح الأول من آية سبعة Timotheus الثاني صح الأول من آية سبعة سفر التثنية 31.6 سفر التثنية 
أشعياء النبي أصحاح 41 آية 10 أشعياء النبي 41 10 وأيضا أشعياء النبي 41 13 رسالة بولس إلى أهل روميا روميا صح الثامن آية 15 رسالة بولس إلى أهل روميا صح الثامن آية 15 كورنثس الأولى كورنثس الأولى أصح 16 آية 13 كورنثس الأولى أصح 16 آية 13 رسالة بطرس الأولى رسالة بطرس الأولى أصح 3 من آية 13 إلى 14 بطرس الأولى أصح 3 من آية 13 إلى 14 رسالة يوحنا الأولى رسالة يوحنا الأولى الإصحاح الرابع من آية 18 رسالة يوحنا الأولى الإصحاح الرابع من آية 18 بأمر خاطر انتاية الطاصر speaking of أي memorizing verses أو ديتو memorize Bible verse قد أجد أو تسقيدة تخرتلة بيلخ بالجانخ أمرتلة بخزت إنا ويا أريا خاقر انتاية الطاصر ثمانية First Corinthians 13.8 كورنثس الأولى الصعة 13 آية ثمانية المحبة لا تسقط أبدا Love never fails خبة هجدانة لا نافل قد خيلة آ جرقة دوانايا خيلة جارب طالب من مشيخة دي أولا خيلة يا أولا أقل داروتة يا أولا إيه بشكش إيه هدية قد ما صخية أو جرقة دوانايا أو جرقة دوانايا إن مصيلو خيتلة إلى زودة من الأية مليانة دمورخ لشميات كل شميات دمورخ لا أخجل البرداسة أب من التولخ من يمينة آل هبابة إن همنت إن قبلت وإن خيت أو جرقة خبة هجدانة لنابل واو أيضا تماصد بيت قدش منخ بيت قسنيانخ مصالت قبر قليطانخ وطلب الطوت قد أتيلا بخطارة فتقلاته سبب همونة آتن لبي جانخ لبي دود برقولخ لبي براي مينستر لبي باتر يركا لبي ملكة همونة بملكة ملك ومارد مروات إيش مشيخ أتيلا آون خبة Love never fails for love for God is love آلاء الخبة إن خيت أو خبة أي إن خيت آلها إن همنت بآلها إن قبلت الآلهة تقيل خبة أو آلة تقيل خبة أه خبة هجدان لي نابل سبب ماني ماصة من بلقى آلة Love never fails في آلة ناطر أخون وخاميل أخون وضيرت الوات أخون صلامة قيمة خلصلوت تخوتامة إن زمت لأي شم آوى وورا وروخة قدشة العلمين بارخ مار آوى ندوشمية نث قداش ماخ تيت ملكو ثاخ نهوى صويا ناخ اي كند وشمية اب ارعى هولا لخمس قان اليومان وشوقلا خوبين اي كنا ذابخ نان شواقا خياوين ولا تعلن نسيونا الا فصا من بيشا مطو ذي لاخي ملكوتا وخيلا وتشبخت العالم علمين امين طيبوث دمارني شو عم شيخة وخبد لها آوام شو تابوث دروخة قدشته وعم كلن هاشا وخلزوان والعالم علمين آمين ألا نطرخ مغدر